Well, good morning, everybody. It looks like to be about 10 a.m. Uh, welcome to the MinStack Monthly Forum. My name is Ryan Murphy with the University of Minnesota. Uh, before we get started with the presentation today, uh, we're going to send it over to MinStack President uh, Karen Zumach for a few announcements. Karen. Why, thanks, Ryan. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to e see you. <laughs> see what I did there? Um, uh, welcome to the forum today for those of us, for those of you just joining us for the first time today. It's great to have you. I see there's lots of uh, our current cohort of Community Forestry Corps members here. I know that both Green Corps uh, and Community Forestry Corps will soon be looking for host sites for next year. So definitely consider uh, working with one of the great AmeriCorps uh, members that will be coming along next year as you work uh, to improve your community for us. We have some great speakers today. Uh, I've had the great privilege of working alongside them as they've been developing this tool. It's really exciting to see it come to fruition. And I would like to invite all of you uh, at the conclusion of their presentation, if you have time to stick around for some kind of after party to do some further collaboration and discussion, we would love to have you uh, connect with us. And then lastly, there are quite a few current uh, MinStack board positions that are vacant, and we would love to have some new faces on the MinStack board. Uh, it would require a quarterly meeting attendance and then some committee work as we kind of work to continue on with our uh, you know, creation of a more resilient and sustainable urban forest here in the state of Minnesota. So uh, that is it for me. Hope you all can stick around and I look forward to hearing what people think about this great work that's been happening. So thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I just have a, a couple few other housekeeping announcements before we roll into the presentation. Uh, first, do please keep yourself muted um, during the presentation. Uh, second, uh, looking forward to next month, there will be no MinStack virtual forum because on March 15 and 16, it is the Minnesota Shade Tree Short Course, which will be held virtually this year. Um, registration is now open. I've pasted the link to the conference site into the chat. Um, early bird registration is open through the 25th. So please check that out and join us. Um, also a reminder that today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted on our U4 YouTube page, which is here. Uh, please subscribe. And if you haven't already, uh, do sign up for the MinStack weekly newsletter. And here is the MinStack site, minstack.org. And you can also find information on those open board positions uh, at that link. So with that, our forum today is entitled Increasing Tree Canopy Cover Through an Interactive Prioritization Tool, the Growing Shade Project a new interactive tool developed by the Metropolitan Council in partnership with Tree Trust and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we have two speakers with us this morning from the Met Council, Eric Wychik and Ellen Esch. Uh, Eric and Ellen, thank you for being here. I will turn the virtual floor over to you for your presentation and thank you. Great, <laughs> great. Thanks everybody. Um, super excited to be here. I'm gonna just pop the link to the tool in the chat. Um, so if while we're going through this, you can certainly have a look at that. Um, we're super excited to be here this morning. I think you can tell because I've shaved for this particular event, which means I'm taking it pretty seriously. Um, but we really wanted to be in front of this audience and we've been waiting for this moment for a while. So we're super excited to, to present this tool to you all. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Wycheck. I work at the Metropolitan Council as a planning analyst within the Community Development Division. And as Ryan Murphy said, I'm here today with Ellen Ash, senior, senior data scientist um, who works in research also at the Metropolitan Council. We're co-presenting this, uh, this presentation on, our, on the new tool, uh, which is a tree, tree planting canopy enhancement and preservation tool. I would ask, um, just so we can kind of get through the material, if you can either pop your questions in the chat, that's fine. Uh, we can certainly circle back to those uh, or hold the questions till the end. That would be 
that would be great. Um, and uh, I think Karen can probably provide, Karen Zumak here from Tree Trust can probably provide some perspective as well, as she was really helpful and um, instrumental in the development of this tool as well. Um, next slide, please. So real quick, I'm gonna talk about uh, the framing of this conversation. So we're gonna explain where this project came from and how it connects uh, to the Met Council's role within the region. Following this, we're gonna discuss tree planting and canopy preservation as a sustainable solution to intersecting regional issues. We will also provide some background for the tool, including stakeholder needs. And then Ellen's gonna take us through an actual test drive of the tool so you can see how it actually functions in real time. And then we'll finish with a discussion of ongoing training efforts and outreach, which I would hope you'd all be interested in. And just to be real quick about um, the tool, it is a regional tool, so it's within the seven county metro region. That's not to say that um, we couldn't do something in greater Minnesota, but I think that there's a lot of interesting things here for, for all of us to learn for those of you who are not, um, who are tuning in that are, that are from uh, greater Minnesota. Next slide, please. So growing shade, uh, how does this connect to regional policy? I'll describe that real quick. Um, next slide, please. So it can be argued that tree canopy planting enhancement and preservation uh, spans all, all five regional outcomes that we identified in our regional development guide in 2015. This is our regional policy document. Uh, so we have stewardship, prosperity, equity, livability, and sustainability. But we're really going to focus here on two outcomes that really form the foundation of this project, which is sustainability and equity. Uh, Thrive MSP 2040, which is a regional policy document, defines sustainability as protecting our regional vitality for generations to come. Uh, trees play a big role in sustainability because a single tree is an expression of policy that can span several human generations. In addition, we need to recognize that land use environmental and climate change policies affect groups differently. This project centers environmental justice considerations in the stories and the interactive tool. Environmental justice is achieved when everyone enjoys the protection from environmental and health hazards. And Ellen's gonna speak in a little bit more depth about this. Next slide, please. This slide provides a high level summary of the information we wish, wish to convey today namely the purpose of the tool, which is to provide an interactive resource to inform tree canopy planting enhancement and preservation within the Twin Cities region. The tool responds to a need that was expressed from key stakeholders. Practitioners have limited resources and, ca and capacity, and this tool uh, can help deliver a multitude of benefits for the residents most in need. So we recognize that foresters and and communities have limited resources and funds. So how can we actually um, extend the benefits that trees provide by, by really making sure that they, reach the, in, that they reach the highest need? This tool responds, um, oops, the tool includes stories from on the ground practitioners and advocates, and the tool is highly customizable. So this is where the, it gets really excited. It provides up-to-date uh, information, which is critical given the challenges such as climate change. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna pass this over to Ellen now as she talks a little bit more about the intersectionality between the trees and regional issues. Thanks. Great, thanks, Eric. So, yep, I'll be describe some of the intersectionality between trees and regional issues. And like Eric said earlier, you know, we, like, we are bringing this uh, Twin Cities Metro like kind of lens to this work, but broader applicability um, you know, these issues are happen and play out across the entire state and nationwide as well. So um, it, this really, you know, there is kind of this this small focus here, but this is a, this is a very broad issue that we'll be talking about here. So throughout the course of developing Growing Shade, Eric and I, we took a close look at four key issues that intersect with the tree canopy. And those issues are environmental justice, climate change, conservation of natural resources, and public health. And briefly, we know that trees are not distributed evenly around the region and that certain groups disproportionately face negative consequences of land use decisions. And these facts are underlying the overlap between trees and environmental justice. 
climate change is another big existential issue facing our region. And with rising temperatures and altered precipitation patterns, trees and other green infrastructure can be quite useful in mitigating some of those impacts. Trees, of course, also provide valuable benefits of sequestering carbon and providing habitat for biodiversity. So preserving the existing tree canopy and considering the value of natural resources and making land use decisions can help us grow and change sustainably into the future. And then finally, we also know that trees are linked to better health of people because trees help improve both air and water quality and are linked to improved physical and mental health of residents. So growing the tree canopy can also improve public health. The map that you're seeing on the right of this slide is showing the relevance of these four key issues to the Twin Cities region. And the colors are indicating the highest priority issue in each of the census block groups. And of course, this map is an overview and local level issues might be different and need a more tailored focus. And Growing Shade does allow for that full customization and in-depth exploration of issues which I'll get into soon, but please remember that stakeholder engagement is also critical to this process. So with that broad overview, let's jump into the, some of the history behind this overlap of um, trees and environmental justice here, and I'll also be providing some recent data that shows how these issues are playing out on the ground today. So really the first thing to consider is that in our region and across the nation, racist policies and history have impacted today's environmental conditions. So in our region, systematic seizures of indigenous lands and genocide occurred as Dakota and Ojibwe people were coerced into signing land session treaties beginning in 1805. And within Growing Shade, we invite you to learn more with a perspective from the native-led Lower Failing Creek Project. And that's a group um, that's working uh, right along the Mississippi River in close to downtown St. Paul. Um, and that group, that group is using trees to restore the Wakan Tipi site. And while 200 years which have passed since the early 1800s span multiple human generations, you know, that history is easily recorded within the lifetime of a single tree. And at least from my perspective, this fact really makes poignant the profound impact that racist policies and history have had in influencing today's environmental conditions. Black communities have also been disproportionately exploited and impacted by land use decisions and policies. Redlining was a government sanctioned practice across the nation that started in the 1930s. And the maps on the right are showing which areas were redlined in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And this redlining policy excluded black families from home ownership and denied all access to capital in predominantly black neighborhoods. Even with the end of redlining, racially restrictive housing covenants continued until the 1950s, and redlining has lasting consequences today, including lower tree canopy in those in these areas. Um, and redlining is, of course, like an easy policy to point to, which happened in the main cities. But this isn't to say that insidious, um, like lending practices and other types of discrimination, did not occur elsewhere because they absolutely did. Um, Anyways, um, infrastructure, creating infrastructure also has last have has left lasting negative consequences on minority communities with black residents and businesses being displaced in the Twin Cities with the construction of I-35W and I-94 to name two projects. And today this really does leave black, indigenous and other communities of color disproportionately impacted by lack of trees and green space and higher land cover of impervious surfaces. Of course, pollutants from vehicle exhaust also bring respiratory health issues to communities situated along interstates. In Growing Shade, a story from St. Paul's Frogtown neighborhood explores these issues and that group's initiative to plant trees to promote a more equitable future. So in summary, all of these racist policies have lasting consequences. And it's really why environmental justice is a key issue identified in this project. Of course, these issues are not unique to our region, nor is this a comprehensive list of environmental justice issues, but it's a good starting point. And it really is encouraging to see researchers and media outlets start to uncover these stories nationally. We're really pleased to add Growing Shade to the mix and want to highlight that our project more precisely focuses in on our region's unique history in a way that generalized national trends or tools cannot. So with that background, here are some data from our region which show disparities in tree canopy cover with income and race. 
So in these plots, each of the roughly 2,000 census block groups across the seven county region are plotted. The panel on the left is showing that tree canopy increases sharply with household income up until the median annual income of an area is at least around $100,000. The panel on the right is showing that tree canopy decreases as the share of residents identifying as a person of color gets higher. And do note that these figures are showing tree canopy cover in 2021. So we're not talking history here. These are the conditions that are occurring on the ground today. For some context to these numbers, I've pulled out two examples. So an area from St. Paul's Summit Hill neighborhood can be seen at top. This area has 42% tree canopy cover, median household income of about $120,000, and 9% of residents identify as a person of color. The other example is from Minneapolis's Camden neighborhood. This area has less than half the tree canopy of Summit Hill. It also has half the median income and six times more residents identify as a person of color. Interestingly, these two areas share the same population density of about 13 people per acre. So it's, it's not a density issue here. Um, these inequities in tree canopy cover mean real on the ground consequences for temperatures. So in 2017, an extreme heat tool was part of the climate vulnerability assessment that happened for our region. That extreme heat tool shows differences of up to 40 degrees in land surface temperature during a 2016 heat wave. And that's shown on the map at right. Now these temperature differences have several drivers. The shading from trees and evaporative cooling from all vegetation can help reduce temperatures. Impervious surfaces and the heat generated from human activity. So here think of running vehicle engines or air conditioning units that can contribute to heat islands which drive up temperatures in urban areas. But taking steps to reduce land temperature is important because extreme heat is deadly. Adding trees can help reduce heat-related deaths. Baltimore and Maryland had a study done recently, and they showed that the existing tree canopy already prevents about 550 deaths each year in a city of 620,000 people. And granted, we haven't done the research here, but if our region of 3.2 million people saw a proportionally similar impact, that would mean over 2,700 premature deaths prevented just from trees alone. Growing the tree canopy and reducing tree inequity could prevent more premature deaths. Vulnerability to extreme heat, in addition to considering variables related to the impact that trees can have on respiratory, physical, and mental health, is considered in Growing Shade's public health lens. Finally, climate change underscores the urgency of acting on extreme heat. On average, the Twin Cities currently have 13 days each year with temperatures over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And by 2050, we could see an additional 40 days with temps over 90. So the climate change lens in Growing Shade considers the impact of extreme heat and identifies areas most at risk from climate change hazards. The climate change lens also considers the risk of localized flooding, which trees can help mitigate via improved water infiltration. Moving on to some data, this is what the relationship between summer land surface temperature during the heat wave and the amount of green space looks like for our region. Areas with high amounts of green space, including trees, remain substantially cooler during heat waves. And here are the Camden and Summit Hill examples again. So the Camden area with less green space had temperatures around 97 degrees during that heat wave. The Summit Hill has more green space and a land temperature of about 94 degrees during that heat wave. And while this difference is only three degrees in land surface temperature, you know, please remember that a whole suite of other factors influence how humans are impacted by heat. So the combination of temperatures, humidity, and dew point, as well as air quality can all make the difference of a few degrees feel much larger. The difference of a few degrees across the entire summer, not just during heat waves, can also mean that it's more costly for people to cool their residences, for instance, by running air conditioning units if people even have access to that cooling. Not only may the total cost of electricity be higher, but given the lower incomes we see in Camden, that cost will be proportionally a much larger percent of people's total household income, which is dedicated to utility bills. You can see how this can keep spiraling into a feedback loop where low income and residents of color are continuously left with disproportionately high burdens across the board. As a quick aside, it's not a good solution to make top-down decisions to plant trees in this neighborhood. Uh, hopefully, I would assume you're all aware of the lesson from Detroit, Michigan, where the city tried that. And importantly, no one asked the residents what their opinions were. There's no plan for providing maintenance for the trees. 
no plan for involving residents and thinking about which tree species they might prefer, and the project was not a success. So while the data on trees and inequities are powerful, stakeholder engagement is also critically important. And you'll see this, this theme continuously emphasized in Growing Shade. Earlier, I mentioned the impact of redlining on green space and temperature. Across St. Paul and Minneapolis, areas with the A grade, the grades being shown here on the Y axis, those areas are cooler during heat waves today, whereas areas formerly graded C or D, D corresponding to redline areas, they're hotter today. So the points that you're seeing in this plot show land temperatures during that heat wave, and the gray line in the middle shows the average temperature of these areas. And this plot to me really illuminates how past policy has ramifications today. And hopefully you're starting to understand that shade trees have the potential to be an important tool for, shape, for changing these trajectories. Now the final issue that I'll describe in more detail is the conservation of natural resources. And so, you know, we're speaking among friends here, hopefully, you know, you're all convinced that planting new trees can be helpful and doing great on the ground work to, to move that dial here. Um, but as you're also aware, you know, growing shade means so much more than planting new trees. It also means preserving existing mature trees so that they continue to grow and provide benefits. Now, unsurprisingly, mature trees offer more benefits than young trees. It takes time for trees to establish large enough canopies to provide shade. And of course, mature trees store more carbon and mature forests are more biodiverse and have bigger benefits on water and air quality. Getting trees to have trunks that are at least 18 inches in diameter is pretty critical. And, you know, hopefully you're, you all know what that looks like, but sometimes I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. But a tree that's 18 inches in diameter, that takes roughly my full wingspan to hug. Um, now growing trees to maturity and conservation of mature trees is often harder than planting new trees. Weekly watering of young trees is needed to help them establish and dead trees certainly don't provide community benefits. And moreover, can be an eyesore and safety hazard. And speaking of dead trees, uh, emerald ash borer is the invasive insect, which is you know, spreading throughout our region um, and will kill most ash trees without intervention. And it's resulted in the removal of thousands of mature ash trees. So it's certainly worth considering that where practical, it could make a big difference to apply insecticides to keep mature trees in place particularly in areas which have already low tree canopy cover. And then finally, new developments in suburbanization also threaten the health of existing trees and forests. And this is why we have the conservation lens in growing shade to provide a way to consider the importance of conservation and management of existing tree canopy. And I'll turn it over to Eric again. Thanks so much, Ellen. Um, well, to create a useful tool, uh, before you go and embark on that effort, uh, you need to make sure that there is a clear need for the tool. So we didn't do this in the absence of that need. Um, it was essential to reach out to foresters and tree advocates for their input early on in the project. Next slide, please. In early 2021, Tree Trust and the Nature Conservancy carried out a survey of forestry practitioners within the region. Uh, you may have actually received this, uh, this survey uh, through MinStack. Uh, they received 23 responses from a diverse range of community and county staff. This slide shows the three most common considerations in tree planting and maintenance. And this probably wouldn't be a huge surprise to most of, people, most of the people on the, this call. Typically, uh, what guides tree uh, planting and maintenance is uh, tree replacement, uh, tree diversity, and consideration of canopy gaps. Next slide, please. However, uh, we asked practitioners what they would like to start considering when it comes to tree planting and maintenance. Uh, respondents stated that they wanted to start planting in underserved areas where a lack of tree canopy can really exacerbate things like urban heat, lack of biodiversity, pollution, and public health issues. Next slide, please. Survey respondents also expressed an interest in a tool that can generate reports, uh, provide prioritization features, and illustrates how various issues interact with tree canopy planning. Next slide, please. Beyond the initial survey in early 2021, 
We also formed an advisory group to help us help guide us scoping and developing the tool. This group consisted of participants from academic institutions, state agencies, city and county forestry, neighborhood advocates, and nonprofit practitioners who work within the tree space. Six focus areas emerged from the advisory group. Namely, they wanted to incorporate neighborhood level voices within the tool, um, uh, principally through stories. They wanted to provide up-to-date data to aid in decision-making processes. They wanted to ensure um, access and clarity, provide data reports and customizable features at different scales. So not only a community-wide scale, but maybe a neighborhood level scale. They wanted to ensure that audiences are varied and diverse and that the data that this tool produces should be actionable and aiding in this decision-making. Next slide, please. So once we had incorporated that early survey and advisory needs into a draft version of the tool, including the stories, it was time to test these out on stakeholders. With the help of a University of St. Thomas marketing class, we administered a survey in November of 2021. We, re we received 44 responses to the survey and these were very helpful in determining if we were on the right path. Um, if the tool was fit for purpose and if the sto stories were sufficiently compelling. The feedback we received was really helpful in honing our message, enhancing accessibility and clarity and demonstrating that we were largely fulfilling the need that, we, that had been expressed. Minor refinements and revisions were incorporated in December 2021 and January 2022. Next slide, please. Informed by our stakeholders and refined through testing, Growing Shade is a project with two key components. The first component of the project is stories which educate about the considerations related to Growing Shade. Five unique stories are highlighted and we profile these stories uh, which is Frogtown Green, which focuses more on equity and environmental justice, the Lower Phelan Creek Project, which provides an indigenous perspective, Washington Conservation District, which focuses on conservation and climate change, Brooklyn Center Community Schools, which is about youth engagement and education, and the Tree Trust, which focuses on tree maintenance and green infrastructure. Next slide, please. The second component of the project is a mapping tool with prioritization and reporting functions. The mapping tool is fully customizable and creates data-driven reports at the city, neighborhood, and individual census block group level. These reports can be downloaded for easier sharing and dissemination. Next slide, please. In summary, Growing Shade, we feel, is filling a key gap. It's fully customizable, it has a laser focus on the intersecting issues within our region. It's highly actionable. And I think most importantly, it provides up-to-date data. And now I'm gonna hand it back over to Ellen for a tool demonstration. Thanks. Great, so Eric did pop the, the link in the chat there, um, but I'm going to switch which screen I'm sharing here on my computer now. Um, and we're gonna take you through a run through. Okay, so hopefully um, you're now seeing the tool here. Um, yeah, Eric, did you wanna kind of uh, talk folks through yeah. the stories here? Yeah, so when you come to the landing page on Growing Shade, you'll see the navigation at the top. It shows the three partners and then you can start to scroll through the stories. The stories are at the front end of the tool and as you, as you start to scroll down, you can see at the top, you have the different themes of the different stories. And you could actually navigate that way if you wanted to jump to those themes. But if you keep scrolling down, you'll see that our first story is uh, Frogtown, the Frogtown Green story. And again, this one focuses a little bit more on environmental justice. And the nice thing with these stories is that we also include some interesting graphics within the story. So this, this particular slider graphic features um, the relationship of uh, race with tree canopy. So you can actually see that where we have higher uh, concentrations of, of BIPOC communities, we have less tree canopy. And you can actually zoom out of, you know, you can actually look at this on a, on a, on a region-wide scale as well to see what that relationship is. And as you start to scroll down a little bit further, 
we come to the Laura Phelan Creek Project story, which uh, speaks of uh, the indigenous perspective and traditional ecological knowledge, which is really, really a beautiful story and how they're using trees to clean up a contaminated site. And these graphics, these diagrams on the side, you can actually click on them to enhance them and make them larger if you want to have a closer look. And then the next story as you, as you scroll down is a Washington Conservation District story. This one also includes a nice slider which shows uh, the difference in land cover between 20, or 2002 and 2021 in a particular location. And the, the idea with this particular graphic is we wanna show the issue of uh, habitat fragmentation through incremental changes to land use, right? Um, you can kind of see how the tree canopy has been um, reduced uh, through subdivision development in this, in this particular example. As you keep going down, there's a really nice graphic coming up here with the Brooklyn Center Community Schools, um, which shows the relationship of extreme heat to the canopy. You actually have the canopy on the left and the, and the extreme heat on the right. And that, that's a relationship we can kind of intuitively understand, but you can actually have the visual here to, to go with that. Um, if you keep going down again, there's a, a nice graphic coming up within the tree trust story, which is the why trees are so cool. Um, I, I think a lot of you are familiar with these sorts of diagrams, um, which really show the benefits of trees, but again, that can be enhanced to look at. And then at the very bottom, as you scroll down, it starts to introduce you to the, the functionality of the tool and the different things the tool can do, like these, these presets um, and the customization features. And I'll have um, Ellen kind of take you right through the, you know, right into the tool if you want to have a look at that. Yeah, thanks for providing the, the drive through the stories here. So up here, we're going to navigate to this, the main mapping or the other tab, the mapping tool tab. Um, it's just going to take a second to load here. And I'm going to kind of walk you through here and do a live demo of some conclusions that we can come, come from, um, but really would invite you all back into this tool um, to explore at your leisure at another time. So um, yep, you, you get to this landing page. And you can see those presets here that Eric talked about. Um, so, so we can think about how climate change can, how when we view, um, you know, wanting to do tree maintenance, conservation, or planting projects, anything like that, through a lens of climate change, you know, we can we can go to this preset and look at the patterns here. Um, it's also, you know, fully customizable. So. We might pick uh, a specific city here and want to, to view how Bloomington, for instance, how these, these patterns play out in Bloomington. So I'm gonna zoom into this map a little bit um, and, and kind of play with the different layers here. So through a climate change lens, we can see that this north area of Bloomington and along the 494 corridor is where this is actually, um, as well as central Bloomington, those are popping out as high priority areas with a climate change perspective. And that makes sense because these areas have a lot of impervious surfaces. So that urban heat island um, impact is higher there, as well as you know trees could uh, help uh, reduce uh, stormwater runoff and water contamination um, by improving infiltration and things like that. If we switch to a conservation focus, uh, we can see that the western edge of Bloomington, as well as along the Minnesota River, are popping out as high priorities. Western Bloomington is actually home to one of uh, the metropolitan uh, region's regional parks. And we see this with a lot of parks, most parks actually, that they are contributing significant green space and tree canopy to the region. And so they're quite valuable there. Um, through an environmental justice lens, what happens here? is we kind of see this northeast corner of Bloomington popping out as a high priority, and I'll get into that a, a bit more. Um, but uh, something that's really cool here is that all of this can be customizable. And so if you switch to the custom like preset, you know, you can play around and you can select any one of these variables. So you might be interested in the intersection of tree canopy as well as um, youth, for instance. And so you can play around with that and see how the patterns are changing here. 
Um, I'm just going to switch back to the environmental justice preset here real quick to, to continue scrolling down here. Um, in this mapping tool, you can also, you know, think about if you only want to show scores that are above five, for instance. Um, there's some descriptions in the, the methods and the frequently asked questions about how to interpret these priority scores. They're on a linear scale, so um, that's, that's how you can start to think about them. Um, but for some reporting functionality, as you scroll down here, you can uh, see kind of the state of the tree canopy here. So Bloomington has a pretty, pretty average tree canopy across the region. Um, Bloomington's highlighted right here. This is the, this top panel here is showing the tree canopy across the region. And Bloomington sitting at about 40% tree canopy um, in 2021. So this is, this is current, this is recent, this is on the ground um, today. And uh, the average tree canopy Bloomington is actually higher than the region average. But if we look at the, the span of tree cover across all of these census block groups, which are the little regions shown here, you know, some areas in Bloomington have tree canopy as low as under 10%. And are probably in need of some serious investments um, in greening, whereas other block groups have tree canopy that's over 60%. And based on our methods here of detecting the tree canopy uh, from satellite imagery, uh, we were estimating that about 45% tree canopy would be a good goal. Of course, because we're we've picked a specific method here to prioritize that temporal accuracy in the tree canopy. You might see different numbers from different tools um, and, and please explore that in more detail if, if you have specific questions there in the frequently asked questions. If we zoom in on this map, um, ha, and click the, uh, the tree layer here, um, you can actually see where, where the trees are currently located. We can also make this figure bigger. Um, there's a button up there. And you can kind of play around if you want to download this or take a screenshot of it. Um, I think it's kind of nice to, to overlay this um, with a satellite, the satellite imagery. Um, taking off the priority scores makes that a little bit easier to see, uh, but you can play around with this uh, definitely. So lots of options here in terms of what you can do with the mapping tool. If we continue looking at this report um, here, there's a there's a lot more information about the priority scores and how each census block group is actually shaking out here um, in it in terms of that prioritization score in addition to some of those raw values behind that so explore that um so earlier you, you heard a lot of details on race and income disparities with the tree canopy and as you recall, uh, this northeast area of Bloomington is popping out as an area of environmental justice concern really for, for prioritization um, of new planting efforts. And you can see that the disparities in race and income, you heard about them on a region wide scale, but these are playing out at, like within an individual city as well. So that's, that's useful information here, all of the Black groups within Bloomington are highlighted in green. Um, here's the relationship between temperature and green space uh, with Bloomington highlighted in here. Um, and I'll just quickly note that any of these figures you can, so they, they get customized for all of the cities in our region. You can also look at the neighborhood or individual census block group um, level. But you, if you drag these figures um, or right click on them. You can uh, copy this image, save them, drag them directly into reports. Um, you can also download the text report itself, as well as some raw data in a shape file. Here's just an example of what that downloaded report looks like. Um, you know, this might be easier for sharing an email or something like that. Um, we include a bunch of information on other resources, as well as a methodology methodological overview, which you can otherwise access through these tabs up here. Um, yeah, so so play around with it. Um, this is this is how to use the mapping tool. Um, like I said, there's a bunch of other resources out there. Of course, Growing Shade isn't the only 
a tool that's that's concerned about um, you know helping elevate urban forestry and forestry in general and giving some tools out there. There's plenty of other um, elements to this conversation. And so there's kind of a high level overview there. Um, right. One other thing that I want to show is how you can actually use Growing Shade to evaluate site level decisions as well, um, looking at census block groups. And so if you switch to this census block group, you can click on any block group and you get a report for that individual block group. But I'm going to switch my window um, again over to the PowerPoint again. And um, I'll give you a tiny bit more detail there. OK, so we're back. Um, yeah, so here's how site level decisions can be evaluated. Uh, so here I've, sh I've pulled out an example that's actually one of Metropolitan Council's projects, um, uh, the Haywood campus for MTS here. And uh, yeah, so this is in Minneapolis. And those the aerial images here are showing the construction of this new garage. Uh, and you can see that it added impervious surface to the region. And it also removed about a dozen trees, which I circled in red in the image in 2010. Um, and, uh, you know, removing a couple trees does seem kind of insignificant, but it's pretty shocking that this census block group has some of the lowest tree canopy across the whole region. And you can see that in the figure on the right, uh, less than 2% tree canopy cover. And now that growing shade is available to provide this type of information, you know, we hope that it starts sparking some hard questions. So how might this property or any other projects help contribute green space to the area? Are there ways to mitigate the impact of increased impervious surface? And having this information, you know, can that inform development processes? Would, would that have occurred any differently? And of course, neither Eric nor I have the answers to those questions, but what we do have is a tool that everyone in our region can now use to start asking those questions. So, you know, we really challenge you to think about these questions with, um, you know, projects that you're involved with in the region and bring these data and these perspectives to conversations that you're already having um, and bringing and, and the educational piece with the stories to help bring other people on board. And, you know, we hope that Growing Shade uh, not only speaks to the need and kind of this understanding, I think that we all share to make regions in our place healthy and resilient and leverage and being able to leverage trees as a way to do that. Um, but we, we hope that it brings other people on board too. So with that, Eric will kind of wrap us up here and then we'll stick around for Q&A too. Yeah, well, thanks everybody for staying with us. We just thought that it, it, this is a really exciting project. So I'm glad to see that people are still with us here. I'm gonna just spend a couple minutes uh, talking about outreach. So next slide, please. So we know that we're here today. This is actually the Minnesota Shade Tree Advisory Committee, not Council. That's my error. So I'll correct that on the slide. Um, we have presented at the Met Council. We're also going to be providing some trainings through the Met Council's training uh, program called Planet. And then we're also going to be at the Minnesota Shade Tree cor Short Course. So those of you who are going to attend that, that would be great. So this is this kind of early outreach uh, within uh, the month of February and March. Next slide, please. We're going to do a much uh, broader broader uh, outreach and engagement in March and April. So in the lead up to Earth Day and Arbor Day, we want to launch a promotional video. One thing we've learned is that Ellen and I can't go out and meet everybody. So like train, training people through training videos um, and train the trainer events is going to be really critical. So if we can get the likes of yourselves to feel comfortable with this tool and and able to teach others on your team, then then that's kind of a ripple effect, right? It kind of an exponential effect of training. So that's excellent. So that's the idea behind the training the trainer and the training videos. Um, and then we'll we'll have some media for a more general, broader audience in April as well. Next slide, please. And this is our contact information, the tool links above. And I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A. If people are interested, I'd love to hear what people think and also if they have any questions. Thanks.
Well, thank you so much, Ellen and Eric. That's uh, it was quite excellent indeed. Uh, really deep and well considered, I think, on all the levels, you know, from the whole project overview all the way down to just all those aspects of the tools. Um, so how we can do this is if you have access to the chat, you can watch that as well. Um, but I can also help kind of guide the Q&A. Um, first, we do have a, a just a comment from Molly saying, this is amazing. And yeah, that was during Ellen's kind of walkthrough of the tool, just like it kept going like, and this, and this. Uh, uh, next, Elliot Redman uh, here from the U of M says, uh, this is great, lots to digest. Is the Canopy Cover tool a snapshot for 2021? Uh, does it account for future growth of trees? If not, what is the best way to do that? So um, I'll, I'll just like, I'll turn that back to you, Ellen and Eric. Yeah, good question, Elliot. Thanks for that. Um, so the, what you're seeing with the trees that canopy cover, it is a snapshot for 2021, um, you know, and you can go into more methods if you want, but it's leveraging phenological patterns as well as sat remotely sent satellite imagery and machine learning in order to pick up on that tree canopy. And so one thing that's uh, really cool, um, and we didn't show any pictures of this, but if you compare um, some other like tree canopy uh, data sets that are a, a bit out of date now, um, you can see that, you know, there, there really has been some profound shifts in what the tree canopy looks like, particularly in the central parts of our region with emerald ash borer um, as a main driver. And then also incrementally in kind of that the suburbanizing area um, as fragmentation is happening. Um, so so uh, what I'm trying to say is that the temporal accuracy of growing shade, that snapshot in 2021, is something that we really wanted to prioritize. Um, and because we need, in order to do that, we needed to use remotely sent satellite imagery that's based on NDVI, which is an index of greenness. Um, you know, we, we can't look at kind of how young trees are growing up in here, but NDVI at its core is, uh, you know, using greenness as kind of a integrative measurement of the type of ecosystem services that are being provided by green space and by trees in a region. So once a tree is large enough and the canopy is large enough to be detected through these methods, you know, we can be actually pretty confident that it's providing super valuable ecosystem services to the region in a way that smaller trees or individual plantings uh, aren't quite contributing in that, in that same, with the same magnitude yet. Um, but if you have other, if anyone has other ideas or things like that, you know, we definitely be open to hearing about them. Um, in Growing Shade, you can download some shape files of all of this data um, and plop that into any type of mapping tool that you like to use. And that might be a great way if, if you have some geocoded points of plantings that have happened, um, you could overlay that. Um, but otherwise, you know, we just want to, to kind of reiterate that we really are committed to this temporal accuracy. And so this time next year, you know, we'll be able to see what that tree canopy in 2022 looked like um, because we'll have that full year of that full growing season and be able to use that to detect trees. And so as the canopy continues to change, um, not just trees grow up, but also trees get removed, um, we, can, we can monitor those fluxes. Great. Yeah, I think Eric also uh, posted in the chat that the tree canopy will be continually updated through remote sensing, which I think addresses Joan and, and Jeff Tam's question. How is the data collected on, um, how is the data collected on, on the trees? Uh, how many, and are drones yeah, so, used? Yeah, I can take that. So, so it's not drones. Um, we're, I'm using uh, Sentinel-2 imagery, um, which is from the European Space Agency. Uh, you folks, uh, Landsat is something similar that more folks are maybe familiar with, um, but has a has a, a bit coarser of a resolution. Um, but all of these satellite imageries are, are super useful. Um, one thing that we 
don't do in Growing Shade, which a lot of other tools do. Um, and again, national level kind of tree canopy assessments are often, not, you know, I don't want to say a blanket statement here, but they're often quite reliant on LIDAR data, which can measure elevations. And, and if you see, you know, an area with a, a tree canopy um, that can be used to, to go into these models that pick out trees. And so uh, new LIDAR data is being flown across the state um, that's in, in the works, um, but we are not reliant on that because it can unfortunately get out of date pretty quickly. Um, so there are of course, countless ways of doing remote sensing. Um, and we've just uh, picked what, what we think is working best here and aligns best with our goals. Great. Uh, another question has come in. Uh, do you know of any tools like this that reach outside the Twin Cities and into other areas of Minnesota? This tool is phenomenal and would love to use it or something like it in southeastern Minnesota. Yeah, I, I feel like I should maybe throw that question over to Karen. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so we've focused in on the metro region here. Um, there's certainly as, you know, I think that there is some low hanging fruit for expanding the reach of this. Um, so you have our contact information. I think it's still up on the screen actually. Um, so feel free to reach out and we can continue that conversation. Um, one other thing that I'll, I'll maybe just mention is thinking about continually updating data. So not only are we concerned with the tree data, we're also considered about are concerned about the people and the demographic data and new data on populations uh, will be out in the next month or so. So definitely look for an update there. Yeah, and along the lines of updating things, I think one of the really cool aspects of this project is those stories that you mentioned at kind of right off the bat. So I'm kind of wondering, will, that, will those stories expand um, how and how how did you identify those initial stories? I can maybe take that one. Well, we worked with our we worked really closely with Karen at Tree Trust and um, Maria Johnson over at um, Nature Conservancy to help with that. And our our advisory group was absolutely critical in identifying who to speak to regarding the stories. And some of the advisory group members um, were actually part of the genesis for the story. So we had people from Frogtown Green on the, the advisory group. Um, so that was a great opportunity. One thing we heard, this is a really interesting point. Like, I think there's a move, there's a real interest in, in elevating qualitative data. So storytelling is just as valuable as uh, quantitative data. And I think that's one thing we heard from, from a lot of our stakeholders is that, you know, we wanna hear um, voices that we don't often hear from that work in this space and that are doing amazing things and they have different approaches to the canopy. Um, so we try to really elevate those voices to, to bring in those new, new perspectives that might be refreshing and innovative to look at and listen to. Um, one thing that I will say is that we want to, um, obviously the stories, uh, they're kind of static in time. So obviously we want to update those. So one thing we want to do is, is actually reach out and build stories based on how people are using the tool um, because the tool is still new. Um, we've heard from our first community last week, Karen Zumax working with St. Louis Park currently. They're using the tool, it's super exciting. Um, so we want to actually think about, well, how are people using the tool? Because one thing that we don't realize as practitioners a lot is that the, the user applications and how people actually engage with the tool might be different than you ever imagined. So that's super interesting to, you know, one thing we wanna do is reach out to people and see like, is this working? Have you found different ways of, of using the tool that we hadn't even conceived of? Um, those are the kind of stories that I would love to build out in the future too. Um, but yeah, I think the stories are really critical. I don't know if Ellen or Karen have anything else to share on the story front. I would just offer that I think there's just really great opportunity to highlight the different things that are happening across the region, uh, just kind of as a little place for those things to be talked about and expanded upon because they could be 
uh, projects like tree ribboning. If you think about how that started out uh, back when EAB first started, you know, having those kinds of stories and of outreach success, uh, I think will go a long way in helping this tool kind of make those connections to that on the ground use. Yeah, and one other thing that I think we've found his other folks have found real value in with the stories is, you know, oftentimes it's really easy to get kind of absorbed in the details and think that everyone understands the importance of these issues like relating to ecosystems and ecology and trees. Um, like, come on, why doesn't everyone know these things? But the fact of the matter is, you know, uh, we can just get so absorbed in, in thinking that everyone has the same background knowledge. Um, and the educational piece of the stories, you know, has been, we found has had a lot of value and kind of getting other people on board here, um, bringing, you know, oftentimes if you're, if you're really dialed in into the conservation lens, you know, it can be refreshing to be like, oh yeah, there's, you know, we need to think about how environmental justice is at play here, or let's think about mental health or just any number of those other considerations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I like to think about the future. Future is fun, um, imagining things. Are there any things with this tool that maybe you were hoping uh, you, you could have, you would have liked to integrate, but maybe the data is not there or other things you're hoping for that this could develop into any sort of dream aspects to it? Well, certainly statewide, um, you know, that's something that, you know, we wish that we would have been able to incorporate um, right out of the gate um, because we certainly heard the need for that. There are a couple challenges in doing that. And so, um, yeah, if, if folks are curious, um, definitely reach, you can reach out to me um, and I can kind of unpack that a bit more and maybe you have ideas. Um, or something like that. So that's certainly something that we wish would have been there. Um, you know, LIDAR data is something that we wish could be in there. Um, one other really salient aspect that, uh, you know, I, I think about a lot is the difference between the quality and quantity of ecosystem services. You know, so here we're, we're providing a quantification of the amount. Um, we detecting biodiversity from remote sensing is, you know, you just need much more precision. So like low flying drone flights, for instance, um, which uh, we don't have the resources to do that um, at this large scale. And so there's, you know, there's, there's biodiversity aspects. Um, there's certainly this element of temporal change as well. So how have things been, how, how have, conditions on the ground been changing over the past year, over the past two years, over the past decade, you know, building that in is certainly something that we also considered um, and, you know, would like to do, but, um, you know, we just had to, where we've ended up um, today is certainly informed by what we heard from stakeholders and what, what data were available and actionable and that we could kind of pull together and, and synthesize for our region today. Um, but yeah, I definitely appreciate the, the question, Ryan. There's certainly, you know, we're, we're definitely looking forward to the future. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add there, Eric. The only thing I would say is that I'm a land use planner um, and I'm not, I'm not a forestry person, but this is, this, is the, this is the issue. And, you know, I've been trying to work with Karen on these projects for a long time, and I'm glad that we're working on this because the, 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 the nexus of, of land use, water issues, uh, tree canopy, climate, everything, we really need to kind of get away from our silos and work together on these issues. So I really want to bring more planners into this space um, because they're doing community level planning and they're allocating resources to things and they're allocating dollar amounts and they're, they're swaying decision makers to commit to things. So it's really critical that we work on these intersecting issues because they are intersecting issues and the solutions require intersect in intersections of working right so we need to work across professionalism or, or, or outside of our professional silos really 
So I would just add that. Great, thank you so much, Eric and Ellen. Uh, I did just post the link to the ISA CEU form. Um, if, you, if you are interested in a credit for this, uh, you can please fill that out. Uh, we're right here at 11. Um, so I'm happy to hold this space open if folks wanna continue the conversation, um, but I, I did just want to say uh, thank you uh, to Eric and Ellen. Um, for your presentation, um, Karen as well for your work on this. And um, yeah, like I said, happy to leave this open, but otherwise have a great rest of your day if you have to take off and uh, thank you for being here.